Hello everyone, I am Bob and this is the Home Bitcoin Immersion Mining Channel. In today's design episode, I'm going to cover how to design a heat rejection system for a mining setup. And towards the end of this video, I'm going to cover a couple tricks to keep your miner from getting too cold during the winter months. So with that, let's get started. Hey folks, before we begin, I want to know what you are building in your Home Bitcoin Immersion Mining setup. Whether it's a carefully designed wonder of craftsmanship or something held together with duct tape and bailing wire, I want to see it. And so does everyone else. After all, we are all learning how to figure this out, and the more we share, the more we can learn about how to do this better. So, send me photos of your setup, along with your name, location, and whatever else you want to share about your build. Send your information to the email address shown below, and I'll be showing your home builds as part of future episodes, so we all can see what can be done with home Bitcoin immersion mining setups. So with that, on with the episode. Okay, so in the past few episodes, I've been focusing on the design of the minor loop of a dual loop system. This included the tank, the pump and cooling fluid flow, and the control system. I have links to these episodes above if you're interested in more info on designing those parts of the mining system. But with this and the next few episodes, I'm going to start focusing on the second loop in a dual loop system, which is used to reject the heat generated by the miners. Now, I know not all of you are going to be building a dual loop system, and that's okay. Uh, a lot of what I'm covering in this episode is going to apply to both dual loop and single loop systems, since in both cases, we always have to build some way of rejecting the heat of the miner to the outside environment. Because even if you are going to use your miners to heat your house or your water or do something else productive with this heat, there are still going to be times, like in the middle of the night on a hot summer day, when that heat is not needed. And so we need to build in a way of rejecting the heat generated by the miners. Now, when it comes to rejecting heat, there are two parts of the outside environment that can absorb this heat, the ground and the air. And of these two options, the ground is actually the best ideal heat sink. Because if you go deep enough, the earth maintains nearly the same temperature year around. And for most of the world, that temperature is going to be well below the ambient air temperature. And so the ground can absorb way more heat than you ever could generate with a small home Bitcoin mining setup. Unfortunately, the downside of using the ground for cooling is the upfront cost and effort of burying coolant lines. You've got to bury lines several feet under the ground and have them spaced out enough to dissipate the heat. This is going to require a trenching machine or an excavator. Uh, you'll need to work around existing electrical and other lines already buried in your yards. It's going to tear up your lawn. And this is why when it comes to home Bitcoin mining, very few people go this route. Now, that may change as more people get into home mining, but for now, it's just not done. And so I'm not going to cover any detail about ground cooling here. Uh, if more people do get into using the ground cooling, I'll definitely cover it in a future episode. Now, before we move on, one little variant of ground cooling I do want to mention is using a pool to cool your miner, or in other words, using your miner to heat your pool. I know there's folks out there doing this, and I'm going to cover that in a future episode when I start covering all the useful things we can do with all of this heat. Now, with using ground as a heat sink out of the way, the next thing to cover is using the air. And this is what most miners, both commercial and home size setups, are using for their heat rejection. Now, there are a few different cooling technologies that you can use here. First, there's cooling towers. Now, cooling towers work by using heat loss from evaporation to cool a fluid flow. Uh, they are most often used in very large industrial processes since they are one of the most efficient heat rejection methods out there. There are a few companies out there that make cooling towers small enough for a home mining setup, but here's the thing. These coolers take a bit of effort to keep up and running. You have to monitor how it is working, control fluid levels, control buildup of bacteria and minerals, manage freezing conditions. It's not something you could just start up and then ignore. And for these reasons, even though they are really efficient, cooling towers really haven't been used by home miners. They're just too much of a hassle for most people. Now next up are adiabatic coolers. Uh, just like cooling towers, the cooling is generated by evaporating water. However, the setup here is a little different. Uh, water is sprayed or dripped into large pads. Air passes through these pads, evaporating the water and cooling this air down. This cool air then passes through a radiator, which is used to cool the fluid. Uh, if you're from the southwest or other dry climates, this is the same general concept that is used in a swamp cooler. Now, I didn't find any commercial options that are small enough for home mining. Everything I could find was really on that industrial scale, but this is something you could build yourself if you've got some decent DIY skills. 
Now, the downside of adiabatic coolers is that you need a constant flow of water to maintain cooling. And so these things aren't going to work well through the winter if temperature falls below freezing. Also, they only work really well in drier climates, which usually are the same geographies that are a little short on water. So this is not a good option for most home miner setups. And just like cooling towers, it's not used that much. Now for the next option, I'm just going to bring this up because I've seen folks ask questions about it on Telegram and other locations. And that option is using a home air conditioner to cool your mining cooling loop. In pretty much all cases, this is really a bad idea. Um, it takes a ton of power to run a two-ton air conditioner, which is really about the size you'll need to cool your miners. This will greatly increase your electricity costs and waste a ton of energy. And we look at all the other options, there are just so many other better choices out there to use. And so this brings us to the last and likely best option for cooling your fluid, and that is what is called a dry cooler. This is the cooling technology used by most commercial and home miners. And the reason why this cooling method is so popular is that dry coolers are very simple, reliable, relatively cheap. Uh, they are readily available in a huge range of sizes, going from very small mining setups all the way to industrial scales. And they're easy to build if you want to take a DIY approach. So exactly what is a dry cooler? Well, it's just a fan in front of a radiator. Yeah, it's that simple. It's the same thing that is in the front of your engine of your car. So what are your options when it comes to a dry cooler for home Bitcoin immersion mining? Well, the first option is to buy an industrial dry cooler. And this is probably the worst option. Uh, industrial dry coolers are generally made for cooling systems much larger than a home setup. Out of curiosity, I did contact a couple vendors for a very small industrial grade setup. And the quotes I got back were for something more than $15,000. So it is really not a good idea to go with industrial grade for your home setup. And so from there, the next option is to get a small dry cooler from one of the vendors offering home Bitcoin immersion mining setups. Uh, we covered some of these vendors in a past episode. There are a bunch of different companies out there offering home setups. Now, most of these are set up and sold as single loop systems, but the dry cooler should also work in a dual loop configuration as well. Uh, you can call around and find out how to get the dry cooler separate from the complete system and to get pricing options. But in general, you might be spending up to maybe a thousand bucks or so for a complete dry cooler assembly. Uh, the next of your options for a home-based dry cooler is to use an off-the-shelf hydraulic oil cooler. These are built to cool down hydraulic oil, but they should work just as well for the heat rejection loop in a dual loop system. They are not that expensive and they are built as a standalone unit with a built-in fan. Um, there are a lot of different options out there. Uh, I have a link below for an example of an oil cooler that should work for a single miner setup. And these could be chained together for larger multi-miner home setups. Now the last dry cooler option is the DIY build your own approach. Now, like most other parts of a home Bitcoin immersion mining setup, building your own is not that hard if you have an idea of what you'll need and where to get it. And the first part of a DIY cooler setup is the radiator. Now, there are some folks out there who have tried to use an automotive radiator, and that's really not the best type of radiator to use. Most automotive radiators are made out of aluminum, and aluminum is a reactive metal. If we think about the other components of our dual loop system, we will likely have a braze plate heat exchanger, which I covered in a past episode. And most braze plate heat exchangers have copper components. Mixing copper and aluminum components in the same cooling loop will likely result in setting up galvanic corrosion, which will eventually destroy parts of your system. So instead, the type of radiator you want to use here is a water to air copper tube heat exchanger. These are fairly cheap and available in many different sizes. They're available from a number of different manufacturers, and they're easy to build into a DIY dry cooler. Um, I have a link below for some examples of these type of radiators. Now, after you pick out your radiator, the next part of a homemade system is the fan. Now, there are a lot of different types and sizes of fans out there, and folks have used pretty much every type of fan with some level of success in a home system. So what size and type of fan should you use in your setup? Well, I think when it comes to picking out the type and size of fan, it helps to look at the dry cooler as a whole, working together with the rest of your cooling loop. If you remember, a typical miner generates about 3000 watts. Uh, this heat is transferred to the cooling fluid through the heat exchanger. And so to keep things from heating up, 
the radiator has to pull 3000 watts from the cooling loop and put it into the air. Now, there's a lot of parameters that go into calculating heat transfer from a fan-driven radiator to the surrounding air. Uh, you have to understand the radiator size and geometry, the fan flow rate, air temperature, cooling fluid temperature. It gets kind of complicated really quickly. But in general, there's kind of a rule of thumb that will work for most setups. Uh, if you have a radiator that is at least 16 inches square with at least three rows of copper tubing, and if you have a fan feeding this with at least 2,500 CFM, that should be enough to cool a single 3,000 watt miner. And when in doubt, overbuilding doesn't hurt either. Now, when it comes to designing how you want to mount your radiator and fan, there are a lot of different ways to set this up. You can orient the fan and radiator in either a horizontal or vertical orientation. Uh, you can use the fan to either push or pull air through the radiator. You can mount the fan directly onto the radiator, or you can use some sort of ducting to maximize the efficiency of your fan. And any of these configurations will work. So it's really up to you to decide what's going to work for your home setup. And to help, here are a few things to think about when it comes to your design. Uh, first, you need enough room around your dry cooler for the air to flow freely. Uh, just like your air conditioner, you don't want to build or locate your dry cooler right next to your house or walls or anything else that's going to block that airflow. Uh, just like an air conditioner, a couple feet of clearance on either side of the radiator is a very good rule of thumb to use. Second, you can think about your local weather and the type of fan you are using. You either have to buy a fan that could handle getting wet or design some sort of shelter for the dry cooler that keeps the fan protected while allowing for good airflow. Hey folks, just a quick reminder to hit that like button so the YouTube algorithm will share all this good content with other people and for you to hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any good content coming your way. With that, back to the episode. Now, one of the challenges of running a dry cooler year round is cold weather. Uh, many of us live in areas where the ambient temperature can get very cold, sometimes below freezing, during some times of the year, particularly at night. If you run your dry cooler straight through these times, you might overcool your cooling fluid, which in turn will overcool your miner. Now, it's fairly common knowledge that if a miner gets too hot, its performance will suffer. But what is not always understood by everyone is that if a miner gets too cold, this isn't too great either. At temperatures significantly below room temperature, miner performance also will degrade, impacting how much hash power your miners will provide to the network. So what can you do to prevent overcooling in the winter? Well, there are a couple of additions you can make to your dry cooler design that will help here. The first thing you could do is to turn off or turn down your fan when it gets too cold. Now, we covered control systems in the past couple episodes, and something very similar can be built here. A simple temperature switch can be put into the piping exiting your dry cooler, and this switch can then be hooked up to a fan power controller to help stop the fan when the cooling fluid gets too cold. Now, another option to keep your miner from getting too cold is something I really haven't seen anyone use yet, but I think it's something that would really work well to manage the temperature of the cooling fluid, and that is to use what is called a thermostatic mixing valve. Now, what exactly is a thermostatic mixing valve? Well, we are all kind of familiar with a manual mixing valve. Uh, this is what you have controlling the temperature of the water in your shower. You have pipes with cold and hot water coming into the valve, and then the temperature of the water coming out of the shower is set manually by turning a knob connected to the valve. Similarly, in a thermostatic mixing valve, there is the same cold and hot inputs, but in this type of valve, the output temperature is automatically controlled. The way this type of valve works is that there is a chunk of a very special type of wax built into each valve, which expands and contracts to control how much cold and hot fluid are mixed together and exit the valve. When the output temperature starts to rise, the wax expands and directs more cold fluid to the output, cooling the output back down to that ideal set temperature. Likewise, when the output temperature starts to fall, the wax shrinks and directs more hot water into the output, heating the output back up to that ideal set temperature. So once you set the valve's temperature, it will automatically adjust fluid flows to try and maintain a constant temperature output. And so the way you use this type of valve is to selectively bypass the dry cooler assembly. Uh, here's a quick diagram to show you how this would work. We have the hot coolant flow coming off the heat exchanger headed towards the dry cooler. 
and we have the cold coolant flow coming back from the dry cooler headed back towards the heat exchanger and miners. The thermostatic mixing valve is placed between these flows and set to the desired minimum cold fluid return temperature, which is going to be at or slightly above room temperature. Now if the cooling fluid returning from the dry cooler falls below room temperature, the valve will increase the amount of fluid bypassing the dry cooler, holding the fluid temperature exiting the valve at or around room temperature. This will prevent the return flow from getting too cold and should keep your miners from seeing any extreme cold temperatures. Now for the rest of the year, when the fluid coming off of the dry cooler is a lot warmer than room temperature, the valve will try to lower the fluid temperature exiting the valve by fully closing off the fluid bypassing the dry cooler. All of the fluid will be sent into the dry cooler, maximizing the cooling of your miners. Now this is a really neat way to prevent your miner from freezing in the winter, but there are some downsides here. Thermostatic valves aren't that cheap, and the ones with really high flow rates are even more expensive. Also, they often don't completely close off either the hot or cold inlets when operating at their extremes, and this might affect your cooling efficiency when you need it the most during the hot summers. So you might have to add an additional valve to completely close off that bypass route during the summer. But adding this to your cooling loop might be a great help in keeping your miners from getting too cold in the winter. So that's it for heat rejection. Uh, we covered all the different options you have to pull heat out of your mining cooling loop, and we covered the most popular option, dry coolers, uh, including the essentials for building your own DIY cooler. In the next episode, I'm going to show you how I used all this information to build my dry cooler for my setup. So with that, bye.